So then we would now like to invite Dr. Carl Jun to the stage to have his speech. Dr. Jun, please. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Kanai from the Chaos University School of Medicine for that um, lovely overview and introduction. Um, so I'd like to give some um, background and status of where CAR T cells are these days and um, put it in context. So, and my disclosures are here really that I'm the co scientific co-inventor of uh, Kim Raya that's now marketed by uh, Avartis here at uh, in Japan. And um, Domo arigato gozaimasu. I am sorry that I have to give this in English. Uh, and um, um, so um, pardon that. And um, But I really want to congratulate uh, Professor Yoshihiro Kawaoka, uh, my co-awardee this year. And it's really a joy to share this uh, with you today here in Kale. Um, and I want to give thanks to my family. Uh, my wife, Lisa Spiker, is here. And she is on here um, on the side of a mountain recently. That was a cliff that we climbed called the Via Ferrata in uh, Colorado. It was very uh, scary, but actually there are things to hold on to so that you don't fall. And, um, and this is my family uh, at a family reunion in Costa Rica. Uh, uh, this summer, and I'm going to come back to that at the end of my talk today, Costa Rica. So, and I'd like to thank my many colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital in Philadelphia uh, for the, um, you know, the team that has let us um, conduct the research that you'll hear about today. And I want to thank my many colleagues that I've worked with over the years here in Japan, uh, and they're listed here um, on the left. Um, and um, one of the first was Rio Abe, uh, who's here. And um, uh, in this photo taken in 1992, this is Rio. And this was uh, Yuji Ueda, who was a postdoc. And Rio had come from the NIH and was a scientist uh, with me in the Navy back in 1992. And Rio made CD28 knockout mice and studied them. And that uh, is a collaboration that continued. This is a paper that Rio published in 2001 when he was back here in uh, Tokyo. Um, and that was some of the basic information that let us make CAR T cells, understand the signaling through CD28. So I want to thank Rio for that long-term collaboration and for coming today. Thank you. And, um, you know, continuing now, I, uh, I want to talk about Toshi Nakayama. Hiri Okada and Tadamitsu Kishimoto here, shown in a photo uh, in 2010. And I'm going to come back to this on the reason this is here. It's the discovery of interleukin-6 by Kishimoto. And Toshi uh, brought Tada Kishimoto from Osaka to Philadelphia when I was president of the Clinical Immunology Society so that, that Kishimoto could get an award for his discovery uh, and invention of tocilizumab, which allowed CAR T cells to become successful. And so you'll hear about that. And on the right there is Hede Okada, who's um, been a long-term collaborator now at the University of California in San Francisco for neuro-oncology. And, and finally, I want to um, thank Toshi Nakayama, um, who I've worked with for many years. Uh, you know, I, Toshi was a dean of the Chiba University School of Medicine. I found out now he's a president. And um, in addition, runs a laboratory that has fundamental discoveries in both basic and translational immunology. And in 1992, we published this paper in Science uh, about how uh, T cells signal um, and leads to whether or not we get autoimmune disease or uh, have a tolerance. And uh, so uh, this, you know, Toshi was on the, the board of count scientific counselors with the clinical immunologist side, and that's how we were able to get uh, Tade uh, Kishimoto uh, to Philadelphia back in 2010. And finally, I'd like to thank Shinichiro uh, Kuramitsu, uh, who was a postdoc in my lab. He's a MD, PhD neurosurgeon, and uh, he was one of the co-first authors on this paper we published in Cell last year, which I'll show 
uh, has a, a fundamental implications on how CAR T cells uh, work in pancreatic cancer. So now turning to cell therapy, you know, we went into with the idea that Cicero said, if you figure out why something's broken, then you can fix it. And that's what he said in, you know, about, um, you know, uh, 2000 years ago. Um, it should be pretty simple. If you know the cause of cancer, you should be able to fix it. And that's not true. Um, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia chromosome was discovered in 1963. That's the first known genetic cause of leukemia. And uh, Peter Knoll, when his postdoc Hungerford, found the Philadelphia chromosome. And uh, so it's a fusion to the BCR able kinase. And you would think then you could really fix you know, leukemia, and it took 40 years. It took until 2001, until the drug imatinib, which blocks the Philadelphia chromosome, was approved by the FDA to treat CML, a uh, 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 formerly lethal leukemia. Now, what one message I have is that the cell and gene therapy approvals are much more rapid. And it was just five years from the time we treated our first pediatric patient that uh, in 2012, that it got FDA approved in 2017. So fortunately, medicine's moving faster that way, um, uh, particularly with cell and gene therapies if they have potent activities. You know, but when we came to cancer immunology, it was not something new. The idea, you know, was back even in the 1800s, uh, Coley, who was at Memorial Sloan, cancer, can Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute, was injecting people with heat-killed bacteria to treat cancer. Uh, and we now know why it works sometimes. It worked by stimulating the innate immune system. And, but basically, tumor immunology had not worked um, because we didn't understand the complexity of it. And now we have the technologies to understand both the host immune system as well as the cancer immunoevasion. And in 2013, Science published this um, you know, they, they publish the top 10 inventions and discoveries every year. And in 2013, it was cancer immunotherapy. They finally recognized the field as, as being um, legitimate. And very interestingly, as, as I'll come back, you know, CRISPR was number two that year. So there are major advances then. Um, and um, so now del delving into cell transfer therapy, there are three major kinds that are in advanced development. The oldest, um, but still not uh, FDA approved, is called TIL therapy. TIL stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And what that requires is someone has a metastatic tumor that's, that's removed by a surgeon, and then the cells are grown in a laboratory, the cancer infiltrating lymphocytes, and then given back to the patients. Um, what's become more practical is to use blood instead of the tumor as a source of the lymphocytes, and then to use genetic modification in a laboratory and then make them either into CAR cells or into T cell receptor, transgenic T cells, and then give them back uh, to the patient. But all three of these are going to be FDA approved in the U.S. It's very close now for lung cancer and cervical cancer, the use of TIL cells. And there was just a, a, a randomized phase three trial that happened in Europe for, uh, showing that TIL cells were their uh, superior for metastatic melanoma compared to ipilimumab. So what's a CAR cell? A CAR, you know, in English is, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor, but it came from the myth mythological Greek um, uh, uh, um, animal that was a fusion of a, a lion, a goat, and a serpent. So it's a chimeric animal. And what a chimeric T cell is, is one that's a fusion between a B cell and a T cell. The two major lymphocytes in our body, the B cells make antibodies and the T cells kill cells. And a car is a fusion of those two, chimera. Um, so there are now two major kinds of those uh, engineered cells from peripheral blood and, and advanced development. A lot of work here in Japan using T cell receptor modified T cells where there's a transgenic T cell receptor that then kills the target tumor cell. And then CAR molecules use, as I mentioned, an antibody based recognition instead of a T cell receptor. 
and the car, the T cell kills the tumor cell. And it has these co-stimulatory domains wired in there that make the car cell proliferate when it attacks and kills uh, a tumor cell. And it required three major advances in science to get CAR T cells to work. Um, you know, the first uh, was gene therapy, molecular biology recombinant technology had to be invented with plasmids and cloning. And that began in the Silomar conference in 75. And then, you know, having gene vector insertion technologies such as gamma retroviruses and lentiviruses to insert and gene modify T cells. And then there was a the cell culture technologies that were required, uh, and that came out of bone marrow transplantation, uh, where allogeneic bone marrow transplants were found to cause a graft versus leukemia effect, and the TIL therapy that I mentioned, where tumors were excised and given back to patients. And then what a lot of people don't know, and I mentioned in my remarks a few moments ago, was that you had to have an antibody-based recognition for a car, and that's what Kuwana and Kurosawa did uh, in, um, uh, 1987, and then confirmed later by SJR at the Weizmann Institute in 1989. So that was grafting antibodies onto the T cell receptor. And then all that allowed us to get FDA approval in 2017 by combining those technologies. And so this was the first paper ever published on making an antibody dependent recognized cancer T cell, or actually it was just a T cell, but, and it was in a mouse. And this was done um, in, in uh, Yoshikazu's Kurosawa's lab uh, in, um, uh, back in 1987 in a little recognized publication. It's now been cited about 400 times. And then Zeligeshar published basically the same thing two years later in PNS, and it's been cited many more times on grafting antibodies onto T cell receptors. Um, and so they both use similar technologies to make an, a T cell that did not require the T cell receptor, but could use an antibody to, to um, bind to its target. And those were fundamental advances that are the, you know, came out of basic science that allowed uh, CAR T cells to end up later being used for cancer. So those initial experiments were done without any idea of using and making a cancer therapeutic, but just to redirect T cells so that they would be a, a chimera of a B and a T cell. And then we did the first trials uh, in with CAR T cells actually in patients with HIV and AIDS. So this started in the mid 1990s before there were drugs, the protease inhibitors to treat HIV. So at that point, people were very immunosuppressed. The AIDS patients all died with with uh, T cell um, deficiencies. And we used a car called CD4 Zeta. And this was a fusion of the T cell receptor Zeta chain, which is part of the T cell receptor. And this activates the RAS signaling pathway and CD4, which binds to the HIV GP120 envelope molecule. And then this retargeted T cells so that they killed HIV infected cells. And this worked uh, uh, quite well in patients. And we then published a 10 year follow up of those studies in 2012 and showed much to our surprise that the patients were all still engrafted with these CAR T cells a decade after we had treated them. You know, and we thought that the CAR T cells would only survive a few weeks in the patients. And then now this year, we published this in Nature, the 10 year follow up of our initial leukemia patients treated with CAR cells. And they also have you know, ongoing engraftment with their CAR T cells. So it's really the first living drug in medicine where a single infusion can last more than a decade in patients because the cells engraft and, and, are, and divide. So the CAR T cells are living drugs and very different than giving cells on a, like a weekly or daily basis, like if you take aspirin or hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension. And so, you know, we treated, this is a group uh, from my lab that treated the initial patients with those HIV CAR cells that lasted more than a decade. And then just as the pandemic started, I went back and gave grand rounds. This was in the military where this was done in, the, in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And the, the PI of that study is Wendy Bernstein, and this is where she was in 1997. And, um, and so we can now look back on that. This was one of my trainees, um, 
who became the White House physician. He's in the, an admiral in the Navy, a clinician who kept, took care of actually President Trump when Trump got COVID. <laughs> That's his claim to fame. So now this is going back now to the general field of car therapy. Uh, and there are these group of um, uh, all white men who contributed to various aspects of the technology. I mentioned Zella Geshar at the Weizmann Institute who made CAR T cells like Kuwana did. Uh, here in Japan that, that were antibody directed. Michelle Sadeline was the first to use gamma retroviruses to induce CAR cells into T cell, into uh, CAR T cells. And, and all these men contributed various aspects. What people don't realize is that there are actually women involved in CAR research, but they all left the field because the f field of cell and gene therapy collapsed at the end of the 1990s. There was biotech involved in all these companies like Celtech and in uh, the UK, Cell Genesis, South San Francisco, and Cell Genesis, Margot Roberts and Kristen Hagee working there. And those companies all went out of business because uh, it was thought it was not possible to commercialize cell and gene therapy in the late 1990s. And so the women then who were involved in this left and got assigned to other jobs. And it was only a few people in academia uh, that I showed you that continue to work on this problem. And I was one of those groups uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. We treated our first patients in 2010, first patients who had had cancer instead of HIV, and then reported that in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then in a series of papers, you know, in other kinds of uh, cancers treated them, all with patient-derived autologous T cells, where we used a, a lentiviral vector to introduce the car and then treat the patients. Uh, and then we began, after the adults treated in 2010, treating pediatric patients in 2012 and FDA approval in 2017. These are the two commercially approved CAR T cells in the US for leukemia and lymphoma. This is the Novartis drug. This is the Kite Gilead. They all target CD19 and have these an anti-CD19 antibody on the outside, but they have different signaling domains. That's one has CD28, one has 41BB. They have um, and different, you know, lentiviral vector versus gamma retrovirus, and then very big difference in persistence in the patient. So you can make CAR cells that can last a long time in patients indefinitely, or you can have them so that they get exhausted and burn out and go away. If you wear, they're, they're more like kamikazes because they turn into effector cells and differentiate. So, and that sometimes is what you want. You don't necessarily always want your cells to last forever. Um, so um, the reason we picked 4MBB is shown here, you know, in our car de design. Uh, Marcella Mouse was a graduate student in my lab and she made uh, and tested cells stimulated repeatedly with either CD28 stimulation on T cells or 4 and BB at various times shown with these arrows over, this is 60 days. And she started with um, the amount of cells in one ml of blood, less than 100,000 T cells. The whole human body is between 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 14th cells. And she, you could see on this axis, she could grow a whole human body of T cells uh, if, you know, if we don't throw them out and count, but the total cumulative T cells pr uh, produced are, are the equivalent of a human body, which demonstrates the cell replication. You know, it's like a stem cell. T cells have a very large amount, uh, capability of, of cell division if properly stimulated. And that led to that use in, in the commercially available CAR T cells. And there's many experimental forms of signaling now being tested here in Japan and elsewhere um, to, to make next generation cars. So this year was, a, was sort of a watershed year because we had the 10 year follow up on our initial patients treated. And these were the first two patients we ever treated, and I'll come back to them, but they had chronic leukemia, and then the first pediatric patient we treated was here. And all of them uh, had you know, uh, remission that was leukemia-free. And now after 10 years, the clinicians had uh, concluded that the patients were cured. Uh, and uh, so this was the first patient we actually treated. He was a retired Marine with a P53 mutated uh, chronic leukemia, and he remained in remission for more than 10 years after that, you know, single infusion. 
and the CAR T cells persisted, you know, so that we could say that they were a living drug in that patient. There were no unexpected long-term toxicities, which I'll come back to. And um, he came back to our clinic in August of 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, you know, and was all masked up, but he had no leukemia. Uh, but he died four months after that of COVID. So unfortunately, I, but he never had his leukemia come back. So uh, we're studying now, you know, how to prevent cancer. There's a much higher mortality ratio for COVID from COVID in patients who have cancer than if they're uh, otherwise healthy. Then in April of 2012, we began treating um, pediatric and young adult leukemia patients. So these patients had acute leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, not chronic lymphoblastic that we had initially treated. And the first patient we treated is here was Emily Whitehead when she was seven years old in, uh, uh, with three time triple relapse leukemia. And then this is her actually in our backyard this May. Now, 10 years later, she's now a senior in high school and applying to college and has uh, no leukemia. Um, and this is what happened with her. It really changed medicine in a dramatic way. We treated her in April 2012 when she looked like this and her cytokines went up like this. Uh, this was day zero here was a Tuesday. So if you count these days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday, she had uh, interleukin-6 levels that were a thousand times above baseline. And she had multi-organ failure and cytokine storm. She had a, a fever of 41 degrees for three days. And it was not due to an infection. It was due to hyperinflammation from the cancer killing her, uh, I mean, the CAR T cells killing her cancer um, is what we found out later. We didn't know at the time. We treated her with, uh, with steroids to immunosuppress her. We treat her TNF blockade. You can see the TNF did not go up very high and TNF blockade didn't do anything. But when we treat her with Tata Kishimoto's anti-IL-6 receptor, tocilizumab, it saved her life. And um, this is then she ended up uh, going in remission. And then three years later, President Obama started something called the Pre uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, a congressional uh, initiative in the United States to augment cell and gene therapies and targeted therapies. And he invited her to the White House because she was sort of emblematic of this new kind of therapy. And while she was at the White House, um, her father, who was in the receiving line with Emily Whitehead, asked President Obama, because Obama asked him, is there anything uh, I can do for you? And, and, and um, uh, her father said, yes, she needs a, an excuse. She's supposed to be in school today because it was a Monday and she was not in school. She was at the White House. So Obama wrote this on White House stationery. Please excuse Emily from school. She was with me. And uh, so she has been all around the world. She has met the Pope in Italy. She's met the Dalai Lama. She's met the president. And um and uh, has is, is, uh, been an icon of what cell and gene therapy can do. So cytokine release syndrome is what she almost died from. It's a pleomorphic syndrome of high fever and many different organ systems can get immunopathology from hyperinflammation. It turns out a subset of patients with COVID also get cytokine storm, but it's not as bad usually as what a CAR T cell can do. And, um, but it's caused many different cytokines and chemokines. Cascades happen in patients when, when they have the hyperinflammation of the, of the CAR T cells killing cancer. And the canonical pathway is IL-1 and IL-6. And, um, and that's, um, this is the uh, package insert and really, you know, from Kim Raya that Novartis has. This is what the cells look like. They're, given to the patient their thought in the bed, you know, at the bedside in a 37 degree water bath, but it has a black box warning for cytokine release syndrome, which is treated with tocilizumab. And that's what saved the field, uh, the tocilizumab discovery. And that happened because of luck, pure serendipity. So my daughter has arthritis. This is Sarah June. She got arthritis when she was six years old in 2001. And she's on two medicines even now. She's 29 years old. 
So there's no curative therapy for this kind of arthritis. She's holding one of our grandchildren here. And then, as I mentioned, with uh, Toshi Nakayama, we were able to give the presidential award to Tata Micho Kishimoto in 2010 in Philadelphia. And then because I knew about that drug, because of my daughter's illness, when I found out that Emily Whitehead had very high levels of, you know, a thousand times elevated of IL-6, it was like not a very hard idea to say, maybe we should give her that drug, tocilizumab, to block IL-6. So instead of treating with steroids, we used cytokine blockade, and it was really miraculous on how it worked. And that then was used reproducibly. The, there was This is the trial that um, Novartis conducted to get FDA approval in uh, young adults up to age 30, uh, 25 and pediatric patients. And it was, you know, one of the trial sites was in Kyoto. And this got FDA approval with an 83% complete remission rate which was unheard of in a trial with patients with multiply relapsed uh, leukemia and FDA approval. So now there are you know six CAR T cells FDA approved uh, for myeloma and leukemia and lymphoma in the US and uh, in uh, the developed countries uh, um, are, are globally. Um, and this is actually the timing of this all development for the Camraya shown on top here. And for U.S. CARTA, the Kite Gilead drug on the bottom, you know, both of them getting FDA approval in 2017. And, um, and it's now a global thing. The big thing that's happened since COVID happened was the approval of CAR cells for myeloma, the most common uh, blood cancer in adults. And they target BCMA, B cell maturation antigen, on plasma cells so they don't target CD19, like the CAR cells for lymphoma and leukemia. So in summary, uh, for oncology, there are many. There are now many FDA approvals, and more than fifteen thousand patients have been treated. And most importantly, with autologous uh, CAR T cells, so from patient themselves, there's not been a single case where they've transformed. We, that was the main worry when we started that the genetic modification of CAR T cells would cause insertional oncogenesis and they might turn into a cancer cell themselves. That has occurred when allogeneic, you know, non-patient specific CAR cells are used in the setting of a bone marrow transplant. And two cases are have been reported from Australia where the CAR T cells transformed and turned into a lymphoma. So when they're allogeneic, they're less safe. The real issues now with um, CAR cells are really for blood cancer are just an engineering issues of scaling out manufacturing, which is automation. And there's a lot of work ongoing in Japan and Germany on this. Uh, shortening the vein to vein time, the culture time. Um, and we have a trial now at Penn where we're doing three day manufacturing. So it's much more real time. And then, you know, incorporating uh, genome editing to uh, with CRISPR technology to to, to make cells even more potent and, and safer. So, so unfortunately, you know, today at this point, these cell therapies haven't worked as well for pancreatic cancers and other solid cancers as they have in blood cancer. And there are many reasons for that that are shown in these um, reviews. Uh, the more complex tumor microenvironment in solid tumors, less uh, trafficking to the tumor and um, uh, antigen heterogeneity are all major issues in in those issues. Um, and um, so we've set up a model, and this is done by three postdocs in my lab, Angela Asnar, Charlie Good, and, and Shun Kuramitsu, who's here in the audience today. And what they did was set up a study uh, using in vitro CAR cells against pancreatic cancer cells and targeting the, the glyca a GPI-linked target antigen called mesothelin and studied what happened to the CAR T cells. Why can't they cure pancreatic cancer like they can um, blood cancer? And they, they characterize a number of genetic and epigenetic alterations that occur within two or three weeks of the CAR T cell uh, exposure to the tumor cells. And so that's all in that paper and cell. Um, and we have trials ongoing at Penn that look promising in solid cancers, either using T cell receptors or um, various CAR targets. This would be for glioblastoma, 
um, and for pancreatic cancer, uh, and and this is for prostate cancer in men, castrate resistant prostate cancer with a so-called uh, armored car. And this is a study that's an ongoing phase one trial at the University of Pennsylvania for castrate resistant prostate cancer that's metastatic. And there's several doses and schedules being tested. Uh, and we reported this in April in Nature Medicine, the initial 10 patients on this trial at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's both promising and um, there's both safety and toxicity that we've seen. So this is the PK of the CAR T cells in these patients. Uh, so these, the green patients started at low dose and they had PK like this. And then these blue patients had a higher PK and same, and then same here. And then one patient at the highest dose had this very high uh, uh, level, similar as what we see in leukemia. And that patient was cured biochemically. His PSA went undetectable within three weeks after treatment. Um, so very uh, exciting response, but he had a very severe cytokine release syndrome that required a lot of immunosuppression, two doses of tocilizumab, steroids, IL-1 blockade, and he later died from immunosuppression. So uh, that was the, the toxicity issue here, but there is efficacy. This is cytokine release syndrome on a heat map for these various cytokines. Patient nine, you can see is all red. And these patients at low dose didn't have cytokine release syndrome. So we have a, um, a dose response that shows shown here both PK, cytokine release syndrome, and, um, and then some patients responding and others not. So, you know, this looks, um, this car that has a dominant negative receptor to TGF beta looks promising in prostate cancer, and we're going to test it in other cancers as well. There is anti-tumor efficacy, but there's also solid, I mean, also toxicity with cytokine release syndrome and macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, and the trial's ongoing now at a reduced dose. So, um, you know, I mentioned that CAR T cells eventually, you know, initially started in, in HIV and AIDS, and now there's efforts to try to make patients have sterile um, so-called cures, not I mean, uh, functional cures where they can't pass the drug, the, the disease on, and they're not, they don't have to take medicines every day. And uh, this is a publication this year from Jim Riley at our group on doing this using CCR5 edited cells with CARs uh, to, to get there. There's lots of progress using CAR T cells to shut down the immune system in a targeted way for autoimmune and organ transplantation. And we have a trials at the University of Pennsylvania inserting cars into macrophages, where the macrophage is then uh, engulfed by phagocytosis tumor cells and cause cross-presentation. And I'll mention then the use of car cells for heart failure and fibrosis. So, you know, it was the first idea that the immune system could cause autoimmunity came from Paul Ehrlich in Germany, where he talked about the horror autotoxicus and um, you know, we still don't, it, it's surprising to me, but we understand more about the cause of cancer now than we do autoimmunity. It's, it's, it's actually been a harder problem to solve. Um, and for many reasons shown here on the causes of autoimmunity. But a very exciting paper was just published last month in Nature Medicine in a case report a year before that of this uh, Vietnamese woman who had refractory lupus and she was treated with a CD19 car cell, the same as what we used for leukemia in Germany. And she had pathogenic double-stranded antibodies and the titer went to zero after the CAR T cell infusion. And her, um, she uh, had B cells go away for a while. She had transient B cell aplasia, but she had a, a you know protein losing enteropathy in the kidneys. They got better, and she's in a drug free remission now, more than a year. And what they just reported in um, last month was five patients, five out of five now, are in remission with refractory lupus now after CAR T cell treatment. So this is, I think, a big turning point probably, and um, of that paper. You know, there were, you know, there's been a lot of patients treated with leukemia and lymphoma with CAR T cells. And uh, the lupus patients, so far only five have been treated. And something very curious is the B cell aplasia has only been transient in the lupus patients where it's been uh, permanent in many patients that have leukemia and lymphoma. So I think there's an interesting immunologic explanation 
for that. Um, so we're going to see many different autoimmune diseases treated with engineered T cells, I predict, in the near future. The last thing I'll highlight here is the targeting of cancer-associated fibroblasts, or CAFs, both in cancers, uh, because the CAFs are immunosuppressive and make scars around cancer and you know make a barrier to um, drugs and cells getting into cancer. And so we've been over the years using FAPCAR T cells, fibroblast activation protein, to target um, uh, the stroma that has fibroblasts. And this is work from John Epstein at lab, uh, at Penn. And this is dilated cardiomyopathy. The green is staining for fibroblast activation protein. So these are activated fibroblasts. And they're in um, non-dilated cardiomyopathies, dilated. They're autoimmune diseases like sarcoid scleroderma and giant cell myocarditis. So we initially made a mouse model and targeted these fibro fibroblast in um, with FAP cars. And these are, uh, you know, um, done in syngenetic mice and showed that um, we could uh, help cardiac regeneration by targeting the scar forming fibroblasts in mice. And then this year we had a paper in, in science where instead of doing ex vivo therapy, we used targeted lipid nanoparticles similar to what BioNTech has used as a technology to deliver RNA cargo to express the car in, in the T cell. So we give a lipid nanoparticle that has anti-CD5 on it, the, and then the lipid nanoparticle gives RNA out that encodes the FAP car, and then the, then the cells are transiently expressed the car uh, in the mice. And we could show that that um, treated uh, cardiac failure in that model. So there's a targeted lipid nanoparticle technology that we're doing with Drew Weissman at the University of Pennsylvania and Katie Carrico, who was here uh, last year is what I heard today. Uh, so this is using that technology and now bringing it into CAR T cell approaches for uh, uh, cancer and fibrosis and autoimmunity. So to summarize, you know, we're an area now where our global healthcare has gone from three pillars of the pharmaceutical industry, biotech, and medical devices, and a fourth pillar has been added on, which is cell and gene therapy. And there are a number of issues that are very unique to this that weren't encountered by the uh, standard pharmaceutical industry, like patient-specific so-called N of one cell therapy that's made one-on-one -on -one for each patient and a lot of issues to solve. One way to solve that is to make so-called off-the-shelf or universal CAR T cells where you would get them from another donor or induced pluripotent stem cells uh, or um, and then manufacture the CAR cells as allogeneic cells. And that has worked in principle in small numbers of patients, but it also has higher safety issues. As I mentioned, sometimes the CAR T cells transform. And this now is a search recently I did on clinicaltrials.gov for the search term chimeric antigen receptor. And there are 817 trials listed uh, this month. And the heat map, when you look on the, that, it shows there's actually more trials now in China than in the US. Um, there are, I think, 19 ongoing in Japan um, and um, that are on clinicaltrials.gov. So very active research around the world, but really none in the Southern Hemisphere. It's all in the developed economies. And so I've been working on that. I, I met with uh, Vice President Biden and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, back in 2017 on policy of how we could extend this. And then uh, this May, uh, Jill Biden came to Latin America. This was covered in the Washington Post. And we met in Costa Rica and signed a memorandum of understanding to do a CAR T cell trial in Costa Rica. And this is Jill Biden here and, and me, and then a pediatric oncologist, Stephen Grupp. So hopefully we're gonna be able to find, can we teach a low and middle income country to grow their own CAR cells? And, uh, and uh, rather than, uh, cause they don't have that at this point. So there are many uh, evolving therapies that are gonna be synergistic with CAR T cells based on animal data. Um, you know, even combining combination standard therapies for cancer, such as radiation or chemotherapy, 
or with oncolytic viruses, checkpoint antibodies. And this year we showed uh, just recently in a paper in Nature Medicine here with Melody Smith and Memorial Sun Kettering at the University of Pennsylvania that altering your microbiome can improve CAR T cells. And this was data using antibiotics uh, and it changes the function. So that's a cell extrinsic issue, modifying their function. So in summary, CAR cells are living drugs. Um, they deliver effects that can evolve in patients. Uh, the pharmacology is very different from inert drugs that get metabolized and go away. Uh, CAR T cells now have very recently been shown to have promise in autoimmune disease. And the autologous cells that are gene modified are very safe uh, in that they can persist for years and even a decade or more without uh, causing any toxicity that we, has been evident. So many uh, um, collaborators I have in Philadelphia I'd like to thank and to thank our patients uh, who volunteered for our trials and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Dr. Jun, thank you very much. We would now like to begin the Q&A session. We only accept the questions in English. For those of you uh, inside the venue, please raise your hand if you have a question and wait for a staff member to bring you a microphone. For those of you attending Zoom webinar, please use the raise hand feature and you will be unmuted when your turn comes to speak. Uh, please do not type your questions in the chat. So, yes. Yes, yes, please, uh, Professor Kataoka. So thank you for fantastic talk. So I'm Keish Kataoka from Division of Hematology. So the so your decade-long analysis in leukemia remission showed that uh, so persistent CAR T cells are mainly consisted of CD4 positive T cells. So I am wondering whether so. CD4 positive T cells are more important over the CD8 positive T cells or the balance between CD4 and CD8 positive T cells are important for CAR T cell function? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I didn't go into the details. So what we actually found, and these were adults with chronic leukemia, was you know the main infused initial CAR cells were alpha, beta, CD8 CAR cells. And at 10 years, the dominant cells were CD4 alpha beta T cells. What I didn't mention was at two months to three years, the dominant cells were gamma delta cells. And they, so they were double negative CD4, double, CD8 double negative. They had, were CAR positive. And, um, and we don't know, so those were a minority. They were less than 1% of what was infused the patients. So for immunologists, I mean, 99% of what was infused was alpha beta T cells, but gamma delta T cells were the dominant two months to three years later. And we don't know the mechanism of what expanded the, the gamma delta cells um, over the alpha beta cells and whether they have an anti-leukemic effect that's important or not. So, so one thing for sure is the cells evolve in patients, kind of like a natural immune system does. You know, we have memory cells, effector cells, and and then, you know, what we infused was a mixture, and then they, uh, they evolved. And I think, you know, whether or not to make a mixture or whether to give, I mean, gamma delta cells alone might be a really good idea, I think, now, mm -hmm. uh, because they wouldn't cause, probably would not cause graft versus host disease. Uh, so there's a lot of new research in this area. Thank you. So any other questions from the floor? Or, yes, please. Oh, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Um, I'm Lena Freeman. I had the honor to talk to you this morning. But um, from a more clinical point of view, I've seen CAR T uh, therapy being used for lymphoma at my at KO facility, and I was astonished at the price at the, at the high price that it set, which is understandable for uh, various um, novel therapies. But how do you think we can make CAR T therapy more affordable and reachable to a broader population of people in the future? Yeah, so there's a lot of research on that, and. Um you know, the most expensive part of a car. So first of all, when pharmaceutical companies sell a product, usually the cost of goods, the cost of manufacturing is less than 5% of their selling price. Mm -hmm. 
I know that's true in the US, it's probably true in Japan. Okay, now with CAR T cells, the, the cost of goods is much higher than the cell, than 5%. Um, and so it costs, I think, the commercial car products cost about $150,000 for them to manufacture. And Novartis sells at about, it's $375,000 in the US, that's the cost. So their profit is actually less, okay? And no, so that, that's a problem that can be solved with you know, improved manufacturing. The number one cost of the manufacturing is actually human labor. And so if it could be automated with robots, it would be much cheaper. Then, so that's one way. For sure, that'll bring the cost down by a log. And then you know, the cost can fall, um, hopefully, with market competition. And, uh, but the other aspect is more of a scientific one, which is could these uh, so-called off-the-shelf cells made in big batches, like from induced pluripotent stem cells, mm -hmm. then the cost would be much lower and the cost will fall dramatically. So both of these things, I think, are going to contribute to a decreasing cost over time. I see. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Professor, uh, Professor Okano. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk and congratulations on the Keo Prize. And I'm Hideki Okano and Keo University School of Medicine. Uh, we no I noticed that so your present work and your series work are tightly associated with the work of the previous uh, the winner of the Keo Prize. <laughs> you know, so that means that your research is a hub of the science. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, T cell therapy, Stephen Rosenberg, and so CRISPR technology, Fenzan in MIT, and uh, and also, okay, okay, uh, blocking antibody to the IL-6 of uh, Tadamitsu Kishimoto. And, okay, LNP plus messenger RNA, Katarin Kariko last year, and microbiome, Jeff Gordon. So lots of issues are related to your work, and so very interesting. So I'm just curious, uh, so uh, one of the issues of the uh, CAR-T so CAR therapy, such, such as uh, Kimuria, is very expensive for the patient. So one of the reasons is that, so, uh, so the company should make okay, so for the patient own T cells. So in order to overcome that, so say, I'm just wondering if it's possible that so we can make okay, uh, HLA engineering uh, induced pluripotent stem cell. Now we are able to make the induced in the T cell or natural killer cells. You can make so, some you know universal CAR T cell, universal okay, uh, <clears throat> CAR NK cells. Is this as a strategy, is it feasible, or are you, are you discussing about that? Oh, yeah, so I had, I mean, there is a lot of work right now making so-called off-the-shelf CAR cells, and they could be T cells or NK cells, gamma delta cells, you know, NK T cells. What um, uh, has to happen is, um, you know, the safety and efficacy need to be sure. So, so right now, there's a lot of work on doing things like you're saying, uh, um, knocking out T cell receptor beta 2 microglobulin and other genes so that MHC and the TCR prevent host versus graft and graft versus host rejection. And then you also have to get rid of NK cell rejection. And there's different strategies to do that. Um, now, so um, because right now the studies that have been done with these off-the-shelf cells, the cells have not persisted as long uh, as autologous cells. There's a lot of progress there, but they haven't persisted as long. And I think induced pluripotent stem cells, I mean, there's a lot of work on that obviously here in Japan um, because of the Yamanaka um, heritage. But there's also work, yeah, Fate Therapeutics is a company in uh, uh, San Diego, California, and they're making CAR NK cells that are derived from, um, just as you suggested, from uh, iPSCs. And those are in clinical trials now. So there's a lot of work to make, you know, off the shelf cells, and they may be, I think they're going to be uh, various kinds of lymphocytes. It's harder to make functional alpha beta cells from iPSCs than it is gamma, gamma delta cells or, um, or uh, uh, NK cells. But um, so right now, the best alpha beta cells have been autologous. And um, the one real liability with a long-term 
cell that you make that you, you know, if you give some, you know, say you take cord blood T cells and you engineer them to give them to someone so that, that patient can't reject them and they'll function as car cells. The problem is, is if they get, if those T cells that you can't reject, if they get infected with a virus, you wouldn't be able to, to control it. So, so there are many lymphotropic viruses like EBV and HHV6, HHV7, and other CMV, which if that infects a cell that you have that you can't reject, that would be a really severe issue, I think. So there may have to be, um, we may not want uh, you know, these off-the-shelf cells to, to persist indefinitely because they're basically a liability for uh, a viral, um, it'd be a privileged site that you could not reject. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So any other question? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Jun. Uh, we have reached the end of the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your questions. And thank you very much for the active discussion. After a short break, Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka will give his commemorative lecture starting at 4.30 p.m. Please enjoy a short break while we prepare for his lecture. Invitees are welcome to take a break in conference room one outside this auditorium. Thank you very much. <laughs>